today on Hands Up Photography, I was able to sit down with one of my favorite photographers as well as one of my favorite photography educators, Mr. Daniel Gregory. And we're going to talk about white balance. Actually, we're going to talk more so about color grading your photographs. But Mr. Gregory is going to share the nuance involved in making sure your white balance is squared away before you dive into color grading and how we can really make your images pop. Y'all stay tuned. This is Twit. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Matt Pruitt, and this is Hands On Photography here on Twit TV. I hope y'all are doing well. I am unbelievable as always. This podcast, I like to sit down and share with you different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor because they go hand in hand. And don't you forget that. If this is your first time joining the show this week, I want to say welcome to you. And I want to say thank you to you. And then I'm also going to say now that you're here, go ahead and hit subscribe in whatever podcast application you're enjoying this on. I don't care if it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or even our YouTube channel. There are subscription options right there. Go ahead and knock that out for me. And while you're at it, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, just leave us a nice little kind star rating and review to help push us up in the photography podcast ratings. I appreciate all of that support. But if you're just trying to figure out the best uh, uh, platform to subscribe on, you can just head on over to our website and see all of our subscription options. That is twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography. And you see all of our options there as well as our previous episodes and videos. So thank you again for all that support. So now let's go ahead and get started with this week's show. Folks, I am really, really excited because I've, I've, I've wanted to do something where I could reach out to some of my favorite photographers and content creators that, that I just truly love all of their work and their energy and just pick their brains a little bit and have them share with you some of their favorite tips, some of their favorite tactics and ideas to help get the most out of their, their cameras, to help get the most out of the images that they're working on working on or just flat out their philosophy, if you will, because sometimes it takes a certain mindset when it comes to creating some beautiful photographs. And this week I am joined by my man, Mr. Daniel Gregory, who's doing nothing but great work helping to educate other photographers out there like yourself listening to this show. So let's go ahead and bring him on. How you doing, Mr. Gregory? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I uh, I love watching and subscribing to your stuff. So I'm, I'm honored to be uh, be included as a part of the family. Oh my goodness. So now you're just flattering me. You you actually listen <laughs> to my show. Oh my goodness. I love it. I love it. I listen to your show too. You you probably see me tagging you on Twitter quite a bit, the perspective photographer. I love that podcast that you drop every single Monday, I believe. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. Every Monday, 307 <laughs> straight weeks. Oh my goodness. You've been on a roll. You've been on a roll. But how you been? Been good, been good. You know, it's a crazy time, but you know, for me, I uh, fortunate I get to do something I love and creative time, and so I uh, I personally have kind of enjoyed the slower pace. I feel like it's kind of going to be a chance to return to some things that I hadn't focused on before. So, but yeah, no, everybody's happy in the family, everybody's healthy, so no, things are good. You know, I need to figure something out here. You're not the first person to say to me that it's been a bit of a slower pace. How come I don't feel that way? <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I've been pushing every single week and trying to get schedules and woo. Yeah, and I know uh, I'm not as busy as you. I, I well, guess it's well, just I don't have the, the practice just yet. Well, you know, maybe slower pace isn't the right word. It's probably not the right word. And as <laughs> you know, and everybody listening to my podcast knows I'm like really specific about words. I think what it is is it's it was 2020 really gave myself and my my wife who's my my partner in the studio a chance to really it's not a slower pace but it's to focus on what's really important right to really kind of reconnect with the things that really mattered and for our own creativity we were able to let go of a lot of things that we were supposed to do with the business or supposed to do with my photography or her herbal work and really kind of come back into what mattered and so i think for me it's slower because i've been, we've been able to shed some of that stuff that didn't really matter and uh and kind of hone in on that. So I think for me, that's probably what slower isn't slower. It's just much more uh, concentrated on what really matters. Right. Right. Now I, I totally get that. That's, that's, 
definitely something that we all should really pay attention to. Now, I want to go ahead and get started with with your tip this week and, and just allow you to just, hey, this is your episode. Let's just have Mr. Gregory do what he does best. And that's creating beautiful, awesome photography, as well as educating the masses on this. So what you got for us today? So I, I really embraced when you contacted me, I, I thought about, you know, should I do a camera tip or a shooting location thing? But uh, one of the things that I, I teach uh, at the, the school where I'm a core faculty member is I teach a lot about color theory, color correction, color work. And so the thing I wanted to do was kind of talk a little bit about the philosophy of color correction. Ah, and okay. So we, t we talk a lot in photography about editing your photos and getting the right color, making things look great. But I was like, you know, do we... Have we ever really had conversations about what that actually means? What does it mean to color correct a photograph? And so I thought I'd take the, my time today to talk a little bit about the kind of the philosophy behind color correction and then how to approach that so that when it comes time to actually then edit the photographs for the way you want, you know you're starting from a great space with your color. Right. And so that was kind of my my my. my, my desire for the day. I believe I talked about it. I'm trying to look back here on the screen now. I talked about white balance in particular yep. back on episode 27. So folks go back and check out that previous episode and that may help you out with some of the stuff that you're going to share with, with yeah, us today, right? Absolutely. And that was actually, uh, that episode is what made me think about this topic um, because the actual color correction, it particularly in Lightroom or Camera Raw, it sits almost entirely in white balance. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes to saturation and HSL and all this other stuff, but really core color correction is really about getting that white balance set and then a little bit in the tone curve, which we'll, we'll talk about. But yeah, at that core, it's, it's getting white balance. So the more you understand how white balance works, the better off you are for getting your images color correct much more quickly. Uh, Outstanding. So. Well, let's see what, you, what you're working with today. I'm going to pull up your screen here. Great. So I've just um, I've got an image up here. This is just the balancing rock at uh, Arches National Park and uh, was down there a couple of years ago and uh, got this shot. So we're going to start here with this uh, image to talk a little bit about kind of the concept. We're going to look at another image of the balancing rock taken several hours after this one. I mean, it was a very long night uh, from sunset to sunrise shooting at night. Mm. And then we'll and then we'll actually go look at an image where we do a little bit more advanced work in the color correction where the image is a little bit crazier, a little bit odder in the color correction. <laughs> um, but when we talk about color correction, one of the most important things about color is that it's a relationship we have to the image. And it's and when we think a lot about photography, we think about our our white point and our black point and setting that contrast range. But color is in there as well. So when we think about a color correction image, what we're thinking about is the relationship of light and dark and how color fits within that. Because color is a story element. It's a part of the narration we're telling within the image. Right. So to, to come in and get that essence of what is the story we're telling, how do we want that to feel, how do we want to respond to that is, is kind of at its core. And so when we get an image up like this, I have to think about, well, how do I want to think about the photograph? How do I want the, the viewer to experience the photograph? And there's certain things about colors that we respond to. Warm colors come forward in a photograph. Cool colors recede in a photograph. We look at more saturated colors before desaturated colors. Yep. And so all of those little elements kind of come into play as we think about how we want to edit. So when we get to that point, I have to think about, okay, well, what does color correction mean? I'm going to correct this. And the normal way people do this when they start out is they will come in and they'll make adjustments to the photograph and they'll monkey with all sorts of different things. Well, here's the camera. This is the exposure out of camera. And okay. one of the first things I tell people to correct color is that color is dependent on light. It's actually wavelengths of light that our eye absorbs. Right. And if you don't have the exposure correct, you can't color correct it. So Please color correct the image. You can't. <laughs> and if I, swing, there. <laughs> if I swing the other way, color correct the image. Well, you might color correct this thinking it's just an overexposed daytime photograph right. without realizing what it is. So one of the first things about getting color correct is about getting the exposure set and getting the contrast range set. And so the, uh, in the hierarchy of correction – what I tell people is getting your exposure right, getting your highlights, shadows, whites, and black points set, that, that's what really drives the experience of 
making sure you can color correct. Because once the exposure is set, then you can, in fact, make the color edit. And so as we get that color corrected, or the exposure corrected, now I can start to think about color. Mm -hmm. And in that hierarchy, we think about exposure, then we correct color, then we work on saturation. So that's our little kind of kind of pyramid, luminosity, color, saturation. So the Got next it. place we would go is tint and temperature. And, you know, what we're looking for at this point is we're going to start the philosophy of color correction. So the first thing we want to think about in color correction is that color needs to be expressive and meaningful. So what is the expression? What is the meaning and purpose and intent of the photograph? Mm -hmm. The second thing we want to think about is are the colors plausible? Do I in fact believe these colors to be true? And even when I work with people compositing, so you take a compositing class or you're working on creating kind of this fantasy world. And even in there, if you're significantly color grading, the colors still have to be plausible in the environment you're creating. So given the context of the light and the other colors, are they plausible? So even if you're not doing realistic landscape work or cityscape or portraiture, that same philosophy of is the color plausible in the context of the photograph important? The third thing we look at is the overall density or lightness of the photograph. So when we're printing, if we put too much ink down on the print, then mm -hmm. our colors are off as well. And I'm going to show this here in a second, how much we can kind of subtly change the impact of a photograph just by changing the white balance. Nice. Then the other, the kind of the big one then is, is it without a cast? And so this is the hardest thing for people to get in color correction is when we look at a color cast, that's the, a, like a, it's almost like a, a gelled film across the entire photograph. So it'll, everything will have a slight yellow tint to it or a green tint or a cyan right. or purple. We want to peel that off and remove the unwanted color cast. And what trips people up is they might say, well, I want a color cast. That's great, but you want to be in control of that color cast. So we remove the unwanted one so you can introduce the one you want. Gotcha. And, and then the last piece of this is that our neutrals read as neutral. So our deep shadows of black read as black. Our, our highlights read as white. And that doesn't mean they're absent of color because shadows contain color. One of the interesting things about color is the shadow is the opposite color of the light source. And so the reason we think of blue shadows is because the sun has yellow. Yellow. And the yellow light creates a blue shadow. But if you gelled up a flashlight with like a deep, deep purple gel in front of your flashlight and stuck your hand in front of it in front of the wall, the shadow would be green. Um, and it's because the missing wavelengths of light caused by the shadow, our eyes perceive the opposite color. It's the way our, our eyes perceive color. So it's a really kind of cool just the way that science is. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> and it's also why I think it's important for people to understand that because when we color correct, if you want those colors to remain plausible, the thing is, while the brain may neutralize that color in the shadow, it knows it's supposed to be there. And so if you make a shadow without any color, the brain's like, hmm, there's something weird there. Mm -hmm. And what we don't want is people to look at our photographs and think, there's something weird there. <laughs> <laughs> we want them to just look and enjoy the photograph. So that's the, the piece with that. So, so in that world of kind of figuring out the color, we get the exposure right. And then, so let's just say that, that I kind of want the exposure for this image to be around here. If I go on ahead now and adjust, I'm going to adjust the, temp the, the temperature, which is on the blue Y axis. And mm -hmm. so as I introduce the blue, you can see now the rocks actually start to almost get more neutral. Right. Because they were painted with kind of a warm light. But now the sky color has changed significantly. Yeah. But the thing I want people to watch for is watch the shape of the rock. As the warmth is introduced, as this unwanted blue cast is removed, you can see the rock will start to get more dimension to it. Yeah. And so people talk about, well, I want to get more three-dimensionality into my photographs. I want them to come off the page or off the screen a little bit more. That unwanted color cast actually suppresses and flattens out the image. And so what people will attempt to do is adjust highlights. You'll come in here and paint with a brush and use clarity. And the problem is if the color cast is incorrect, the introduction of clarity doesn't fix that dimensionality problem. Ah. We still have a flatness in there that's caused by that suppression of the colors that's underneath. And so the way the analogy I use is everybody, every pixel should get their oxygen. And the the color cast that's over the whole image is is a oxygen suppressor. So we're just pulling that off and let everybody take in a deep breath. They get to fill up with air and their true color gets to shine through. Love then that once, analogy. <laughs> thanks. Then once that, that shows through, now I can come in and make some decisions about color, texture, if I want to use HSL, any of those tools. 
I'm going to get those into effect. Now, if I jump over to this other image from uh, uh, there's the balancing rock from the other side. Okay. Now this is taken at sunrise, so this is as shot out of camera. This is kind of the colors we get. Now, in the unwanted cast here, uh, one of the things I like to do is I'm up here in the histogram in Lightroom, and you can have the option to show LAB color values. If you don't, as I mouse over, what you'll see is percentages of red, green, and blue. That doesn't really help me as a editor. Like, okay, so I have 38% red, 36% green, and 43% blue, but it, right. I, it's not RGB values. In Camera Raw, we get a little bit more help. But in Lightroom, what I like to do is show the LAB color values. And now when I mouse over, what I see is the L value, the A value, and the B value. And in this case, L is luminance value, A is mm -hmm. blues and yellows, and B is greens and magentas. So if I mouse over down here into my shadow, you can see that A is minus, or as A is 0.1 and B is minus 0.2. When A and B are zero, that means the color is neutral. There's not no real color cast in there. So okay. my, my shadows in here are pretty neutral. Um, and so I don't have to worry about a really deep color shadow cast in there. But if I look at this sky, even without looking at my RGB values up there, I can kind of see this odd green. And then hmm. because I've looked at a lot of color correction work, I can actually see some green down here in this orange. Yep. And then the sky up here actually has some green in it. And it's hard to see because there's magenta coming in there. But as you practice your color correction enough, you'll start to see weird color everywhere. It starts to, st starts to stand out a little bit more. It does. Yeah. It's. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this unwanted green cast from the image. And as I do that, you can see now this, what was green down there, has got a more natural color transition from the purples into the oranges. Yeah. And now if I don't like the purple, so now I've, I've neutralized a good chunk of that color. And that sky, that time of day, was this weird kind of purple-orange color. But I want it to be a little bit more blue. So this is now where I've gotten control of the color cast. And now I'm going to introduce a little bit more blue to push it more into plausible. Cause if you've never been to the Southwest, it's hard to buy that purple sky. <laughs> uh, but if I push in a little bit of blue, now I get a really beautiful kind of blue to yellow orange transition. And I don't have any of that green in here. That's actually moves through almost a neutral a touch bit of green in there. So I could actually pull out probably a little bit more and get a really nice transition in there for that sky. So again, it doesn't have to be a huge correction, but I've removed the unwanted color. So I think there's something else that you could mention in there as well is notice your histogram in the upper right. Yeah. When, when you try to attack that green, there's a green channel showing there in your histogram. Yeah. You can see how it changes and moves every time you touch one of those sliders. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And it's it's one where the his, this is where, you know, the histogram becomes a valuable tool because it's helping you understand what the slider is doing mm -hmm. uh, versus editing to a histogram. It's more what's what's actually happening. I think that's a great point to, to call out. The other piece while I'm here, before we jump into the last image we'll look at for a really wicked piece of color, um, <laughs> is if you're not sure what's going on. So if we kind of come back here to as shot. If I move that slider bar to the left to introduce some more green, look how fast the sky turns green. Oh, my. <laughs> and so the, the thing is, when you've got a the color in there that shouldn't be there, introducing more of it makes it really bad really fast. So right. if you're not sure what color you have, just kind of move these sliders a tiny bit and do an eye doctor test. You're like, that's worse. That's better. <laughs> you know, I come up here, I'm like, you know, actually, that's, you know, an, an interpretation. But I'm like, OK, I can live with that. But now this is starting to get almost a brown color to it. Right. This guy wouldn't have brown in it. So I'm like, okay, I probably need to go Boy, back I hope towards not. the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's not LA. Um, that's one of the purest airs you can breathe. Um, okay, I'm going to jump over to this uh, image. So this was actually shot specifically for this exercise. So for mm -hmm. my, my color class, I make them color correct this image. But I don't tell them what I've told you all about what color correction means. I'm like, please fix this. Oh my! Which is just you, hilarious. You are so cruel <laughs> as an instructor. Oh my, man! Um, the the best part is, you know, they uh, in a normal non-COVID year, you were in person and they print it. You put these twelve prints up on the wall, and everybody's like, "Are any of those right?" <laughs> like it's just they're really different. Um, so the inclination for some people is to grab the white balance uh, wand and to come in and click on something that they believe should be neutral. Uh huh. Um, and and. You know, as you mentioned in the video, that white balance tool is not about what's white. It's about what's neutral. So if I look in here, I'm like, well, there's concrete back there. So I'll click on that. Oh, that's actually pretty good. That actually neutralized a lot of that really weird neon sodium vapor light. Mm -hmm. 
But if I grab that wand again, and well, maybe this should be neutral, or that should be neutral, or that should be neutral, or that's concrete up there, and that should be neutral. So which concrete is correct? So that's so that's that's why one of the things we have to look at is kind of across the whole image, how do we perceive and understand the color? And so because if I grab the concrete up here, and I just use the white balance tool here again to neutralize that out. You can see now there's green in there, but this back corner got really, really green. Yep. Well, the reason for that is those are fluorescent lights. And so they've got an insane amount of green in them because that's their dominant wavelength. Right. So um, it's just the science behind it. Yeah, it's just the science. Yeah. And and it's it's one of the worst lights you can get in your for your eyes in your house are those curly Q fluorescent bulbs that go inside a lamp because mm-hmm. it's, it's a horrible green yellow that just is it is damaging for your eyes and impossible to color correct so i always tell people get rid of those bulbs if you're going to do interiors um but as we look at the rest of the the image you know one of the things i've got to decide now is well i can color correct out that green you know and then if i correct that out now i get the purple up front and or do I worry about that garage back there? So if I mm-hmm. try to neutralize for that garage back there, what color do I get there? So a lot of understanding color is understanding the light sources that are there mm-hmm. and finding the balances within them. So in this case, I could probably stand to pull out a little bit of that uh, purple that was in the front. Now, that this is actually probably close to the quality of light because these are hot pink neon all right. over the place. So right. that's probably in the ballpark. But again, now I'm... I've got control of the color. I've removed the significant unwanted crazy green. But now, you know, probably, you know, somewhere in there starts to make it look more believable to me. Like if I was just driving down the street, that's kind of what my eyes would see. And what I've had to do is kind of split the difference between the green in the background Mm -hmm. and the pink in the foreground. But the interesting thing about color correction is if we buy this concrete as being what we believe to be, again, plausible. Do I believe that this color is plausible, the pink neon, that, you know, this side of the building looks good, that that looks relatively white, even though there's a color cast in there? Mm -hmm. As soon as I buy the plausibility of the color, of a color, I'll buy the plausibility of the rest of the image. So the fact that these rocks look like rocks, your brain starts to think, well, those colors must be right. And oh, that's a pink neon. That looks like an open sign. Oh, I can buy the rest of the color. So that's at the kind of the core of that plausibility. If you can get to remove the unwanted cast and get to a plausible color, then people will accept the colors that are your image as being accurate. Um, the, the last little piece before we wrap up is an image like this. Um, so this Ooh. is this is in the Seattle Library uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest, and they have a red floor. The entire floor is this crazy Ooh. red color. And so in terms of color correction within here, you know, I've got – the, the inclination might be, well, I got to get try to get rid of a bunch of that red, you know, and how do I, what, what do I do? Well, there's no swing wow. that you can make because mm. of the red that's in there. So again, this goes back to getting the exposure right and then getting the characteristic of the color you want to be accurate. Right. Um, so that'd be, that would be the piece. So even in an odd image, again, we're just going back to, you know, can I believe that those colors in that universe exist, even though this is a completely fabricated universe? <laughs> Um, one other piece for quick color correction. We jump into this one. One other place that uh, I think is an important part for color correction. And if you're in Photoshop, which I won't jump into, this would be your, your color correction to Photoshop. Um, as we look at the actual curves, we have the RGB curve, which will adjust the overall luminance value, but then we end up with red, green, and uh, blue. Mm -hmm. Each one of these controls color within the photograph by and far one of my favorite tools yep and, in, tool. and when everybody tells me i want to learn how to be great as an editor i'm like great learn curves and learn to mask and you're done like yep a curve controls everything and so get control of that now in the color world what's really cool is in lightroom and a camera raw they did this for you and in photoshop they they, they didn't. didn't but <laughs> you can see that if i drag this curve up i'll introduce blue and if i drag it down i'll introduce yellow Green, I'll get green and magenta, and I'll get red and cyan. So one of the other things that can happen, in a di- particularly in a digital photograph, uh, we can have an area of the photograph where we say, well, you know, in the shadow, what I want to do is I- I've got a aspect of that shadow that I want to warm up or cool. 
we can come in and use a tone curve to target the color correction within a certain area of the photograph. So if I grab the shadow area, and let's say like I want to introduce a little more green into my shadows, I can you know, grab the targeted adjustment tool here and come out. There's my point. Mm -hmm. image, drag up and introduce a little green into the shadow. You know, come back in and straighten my curve out. And now I've got some green that's been introduced into that sh the, the shadow. Right. Area. So I can come in and, and have that selective control. And the only place to get this control of your color is in the tone curve. The HSL sliders won't do it because you can't mask them. And because right. so these are all global adjustments. So, yeah, in terms of color correction, you know, after white balance, your best friend is the tone curve adjustment when you get in here with those. And so that would be the, the, the piece to focus. And again, returning to that expressive use of color. The correct exposure density is the color plausible. Is the color not have that unwanted cast? And then your root neutrals read as neutral. If you can get your images to that, I think you're going to find a lot of freedom in your work. The other piece that I will say that in all the students I work with and all the people who take my classes, if you get that global color correction done right away, you'll be surprised how less you have to do regional and local adjustments with gradients and brushes. Most of the work people do to fix an image is trying to fix that color that they should have removed early on. And if you can get that, you'll be surprised how good your camera did to get you the right exposure and right color once the unwanted cast is gone. So that would be the, the piece. If you could, A skill to really acquire would be just to practice getting that white balance as good as possible, as fast as possible. You'll be surprised how much better you can edit. Yep. And that's only going to come with practice with practice spend okay. some time in your home a lot of us are doing a lot of shelter in place just to trying to keep this pandemic from spreading as fast as it can um, so while you're at home take some time to practice some of these tools and, and and go over these these concepts that mr gregory has discussed today yeah i agree i i I set up time to practice. So people ask me like what do you what do you practice? I'm like I practice masking, I practice the brush, I pra like cuz it's amazing how fast that stuff disappears and so yeah. <laughs> so true. Agree, so I true. agree. Practice, practice, practice. All right. Well, Mr. Gregory, thank you so much for this outstanding tip and lesson. Uh yeah, I, I can tell that you you really enjoy teaching people and educating people in this. It, just, it really did just come through. Thank you so much for this. Tell everybody watching the show and listening to the show where they can find you and find out more about what you're doing with the folks like, say, Creative Live or even uh, some of the other conferences that you've worked with. Yep. So my uh, website is Daniel J, just the letter J, Gregory dot com. And uh, on social media, it's just Dan Greg Photo, pretty much everywhere, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere like that. And my podcast is the Perceptive Photographer Podcast, which is not anything technical. It's really about kind of the experience of uh, trying to live a creative life and as a photographer, kind of just the day-to-day -day things that come up and inspire me or confuse me or, or flummox me in any way. And so it's a short little podcast comes out every Monday. So that's kind of where you can find it. <laughs> And I love it. It's usually about 10 to 15 minutes or so. It's just it's a perfect bit of a, a good nugget of information each and every Monday. And it really helps keep me going. I do. I do enjoy your show and I do appreciate you doing that show each oh, week, you. sir. All thank right. You. Thank you again, sir. All right, folks, everybody, uh, go ahead and get your cameras, whether it's your smartphone or DSLR mirrorless, whatever it is you got. Get over there and just start practicing. Start practicing these tips and these fundamentals that we discussed today. And uh, while you're at it, go back and check out some of the previous episodes. I talked about the curves. I believe it was episode 17-ish, something like that. Mr. Victor will find it because Mr. Victor makes me look good. <laughs> but there is a previous episode where I discuss curves. Go back and check that out and learn a little bit more about that tool. It's not only in Photoshop and Lightroom, but it's also available in a lot of your smartphones apps such as Snapseed. Totally free to use. All right. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you all so much for being a part of the hands-on photography community. Please continue to support the show by sharing it out to other people that may be interested in this podcast and learning more about photography and leaving comments and, and, and the likes and all of that magical social media stuff that works that I don't quite have a grasp on. But Y'all know how to make it work. So I appreciate you doing that. If you have any other questions or feedback, feel free to shoot an email over to hop at twit.tv. That's hop at twit.tv. I try to answer my, the emails as fast as I can when I get them. I'm still catching up on them because you folks have been quite a... Uh, 
quite ambitious with your emails, and I love it. I've really enjoyed the conversations and the feedback. And also give me a follow over on Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter, I am Ant underscore Pruitt. And on Instagram, I'm also Ant underscore Pruitt. Follow me on those platforms, and I tend to share a little bit of behind the scenes, if I can, of what's going on for setting up shows, setting up shops, and things like that. All right. So until next time, folks, thank you again for all the support. And we'll catch you later here on Hands On Photography. Now, safely create and dominate. Y'all take care. We do appreciate you watching this show right here on the Twit Network. If you want to make sure you are up to date on all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, all the OSs from Apple, you've got to check out iOS today. Rosemary Orchard, the incredible Rosemary Orchard, and myself talk each week about the news for iOS, the best apps and games, and so much more. You've got to check out the show. And we do appreciate you for subscribing. Thank you.